Hi everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we will discuss about the test bench to simulate the three important parameters for a cascode amplifier. So we said any single stage amplifier uh, can be represented by its equivalent two port model. So from that, we can say that there are three important parameters. One is the input resistance Rn, the output resistance and the unloaded gain. For a cascode amplifier, the input resistance is infinity because you are looking into the gate, the low frequency input impedance is infinity. So we don't need to worry about it. But we have to have a test bench to measure the unloaded gain and the output resistance. So shown in this figure, uh, shown in this figure is actually a test bench to measure the intrinsic gain, the unloaded gain, sorry. Okay. So uh, uh, to before I explain the test bench, I've, I've already given an idea about the how to go about uh, building test benches for comp for single stage amplifiers. Okay. So I'll very briefly uh, revise what we had done earlier. So for example, let's say I want to just bias a common source amplifier. Then I can simply put a gate voltage, a DC voltage at the gate and then force a current ID into the device in this way as shown here. Now we know that for the time being, we'll assume that there is no VDS dependence, you know, VDS, uh, the drain current is independent of VDS. So this is the graph it's going to follow. So for a fixed value of VGS, the drain, the, the drain voltage can be anything here. But you say that when, once you say that I've biased a device, once you say that you have biased a device, the drain to source voltage, VDS, VGS and ID, or at least VGS and VDS has to be defined. Okay, all the three parameters has to be defined. So uh, said otherwise, what you can see here is that this MOSFET behaves like a current source, which means uh, for any, for, for a range of values of VDS, the current is going to be simply equal to ID. So which means the VDS here is not defined. I'm not defining what that value should be. So that's the problem with this test bench. But of course, if you simulate it in a software, in a simulation software, you will see that the software is settling to some quiescent DC, uh, the VDS voltage. And that's because uh, it, it's not really a, a constant straight line like this. It's, it's, it's in fact a line with a slope. And that slope is given by one by R naught. That we are already aware of that. So which means for every drain current, there is a unique VDS and VGS. But what happens is when you design the circuit, even if you're making some small changes in the width, you will see some huge variations in VDS. Okay, so to avoid that, to have a stable operating point, you can go for a circuit like this. That's what you can actually, in fact, uh, to let me just uh, talk about a more simpler one is you can, you can simply diode connect the gate and drain. So in that case, you don't need a DC voltage source to set the current in it. So now you can just directly force a current into a diode connected MOSFET with gate and drain shorter to each other. Now the advantage of this is there is an inherent feedback in the structure. So the VGS here will be exactly equal to the VDS of this device. So the VDS is exactly defined here in the circuit. But the main problem is if let's say I want to measure this, I mean I want to simulate the gain of a common source configuration, I have to AC couple the input this way. Okay, I have to AC couple the input this way. Now the problem is that uh, there is, of course, when you up, uh, if your input is applied to the MOSFET, there is a current GMVI in response to the input here. I mean, that's because your capacitor will short to this input node, AC will be coupled to the input node and the gate node, and you'll have a current GMVI through this device. But there is also a direct path from the input to the output. And this is something we don't want to have. Okay, so one way to fix that is we can actually have a very large inductor between the two terminals, a very large inductor. So inductor, we know that, you know, the, uh, it's, it's, it's impedance is a function of frequency. So if you just keep increasing the frequency, then its impedance will become very large. And uh, let's say we choose the inductance value large enough such that the frequency omega L is the impedance, uh, sorry, at frequencies of interest when we are simulating the circuit, we can ensure the impedance can be really, really large. Okay, so how large we will we'll, uh, we'll come to that in a few moments. Now, instead of an inductor, I can directly go for a resistor. I can simply add a resistor RB between the drain and gate terminals. Now, as far as DC is concerned, we know that there is no gate current flowing through the MOS. So there will be no voltage drop across RB. So the voltage drop across RB will be zero. So as far as DC is concerned, it will simply approximate a diode connected MOSFET shown here. Okay, 
so the dc point is dc bias point is properly set okay at the same time for as far as ac is concerned uh, we can derive the expression so you sh you should actually visualize that there are two paths for the ac input signal so let me just apply the signal as it is here so if i'm I have AC coupled the signal here VI. So because of VI, there is a current GMVI which is getting developed and it's flowing into the output node. Okay. In addition to that, VI also has a direct path from RB to the output node. Okay. So in fact, the resistance seen at the output node is R0. So if you see, I've written the gain. If you want, if you're supposed to find the gain expression for this circuit, it's going to be R0 by R0 plus RB. And this is because of the forward path through RB. Okay, so you can visualize there is RB here and at the output there is a resistance R0. So there will be one direct path because of the voltage source through RB, the input voltage source through RB. In addition to that, you will also have a path uh, which is the desired path, which is the desired current path is uh, through the MOSFET. So MOSFET responds in response to the input voltage that you apply and that voltage developed will be GM into RB parallel R0. Okay. So this you can verify it yourself. I've already derived this in the common source lecture. Okay. So now if you choose your RB much greater than R0 of your MOS device, then I can ignore this term and this term will simply reduce to minus GM R0. So which is the unloaded gain of a common source amplifier. Okay. So this way by adding a resistor, I can actually resistor, the resistor value should be chosen appropriately. It should be chosen such that it's much greater than R0. So the typical simulations that I give for my students, uh, the value of R0 will be of the order of few kilo ohms, tens of kilo ohms. So RB uh, is chosen in the order of hundred ohms, hundreds of hundreds of mega ohms. Sorry, okay. RB is chosen in the order of hundreds of mega ohms so that it doesn't interfere with your uh, simulation results. Now coming back to this inductor. Uh, since we are going to do an AC simulation to find the gain, uh, the, D, the low frequency gain, we will be simulating it over a range of frequencies to find the gain. So in those range of frequencies, the impedance omega L has to be much greater than or not. Following under, uh, we, can, we can do a similar analysis as we did for assuming for a resistive load, okay, for a resistive uh, impedance between drain and source, we will get a similar result. So you're, you're the frequency range of interest when you are, where you are simulating the AC analysis the impedance of the inductor has to be much greater than or not. If you ensure that, you can again use this test bench as well to measure uh, the gains, the AC gain. Okay, so that is the reason why we added the resistor, and uh, we also discussed uh, why did we dis why did we add a voltage source in between? So we actually added a voltage source in between in addition to the resistor. Okay, so this voltage source value is VB. Now by adding a resistor alone, we are forcing the drain to source voltage to be exactly equal to VGS. So in our simulation, the VDS was exactly equal to VDS and that's that's never the case. We will always ensure VDS to be slightly smaller than VGS, okay, for swing and all that. So by adding a voltage source VB here, uh, the voltage drop across the resistor is zero. As far as DC is concerned, the resistor drop is zero. So the circuit will reduce to something like this. So you have a constant current getting injected in this, into this node. So here we can write VDS will be equal to VB plus VGS. Now I can add a negative voltage VB and reduce VDS in the simulation. Okay. So now I've just given an extra degree of freedom to tweak VDS. So I can independently set VDS and VGS in the simulation, fixing the current. Okay. VGS cannot be varied because once you fix your current and the dimensions VGS is fixed, but VDS can be varied. You can simulate the circuit for different values of VDS. So that's the purpose of adding this resistance, uh, the voltage source PV. Okay. Uh, and uh, now to simulate a cascode, see what I've discussed so far is just to simulate a common source configuration. So this is one of the common mistakes uh, my, uh, students used to perform when I give them directly an assignment to simulate a, a cascode configuration. So if you uh, see the structure here, you can give, you can apply. So again, uh, in a similar way, we have applied gate to source voltage for the first device. I'll call it device one and device two. And at the second gate, we have applied a voltage VG2. Now in this circuit for the time being, let's assume that both the devices are in saturation. Okay. And let's assume that also assume that your drain current has no dependence on uh, VDS. Now in that case, the first device is going to have a voltage of VGS one. Okay. 
Now the drain to source voltage of the first device is exactly defined in this problem because your VDS1 is simply VG2 minus VGS2. So VG2 minus VGS2. Okay. So the VG, VG2 the no, is the node voltage here and VDS1 will simply be this. Now VG2 is defined because you have applied a DC voltage source. VGS2 is also defined because once you set your W by L and bias current, VGS2 is also defined. If I ignore the variations, uh, dependence on VDS. Okay. So VDS1 is exactly defined in this, in this case, if I go for a biasing scheme like this. But the problem with this is VDS2 is still not defined. Okay. Again, the same problem exists there. Uh, you are forcing a current into a MOS device. The second MOS device again can carry any current. If you, are, you neglect the VDS variation, you can have a wide range of values of VDS2, which will give me, uh, you know, which, which, will, uh, which will work for the same current. But in reality, when you simulate it, you will actually see some value of VDS2. But as I again, as I said, uh, when you are going to vary W by L's, you will see some sudden changes in the VDS of the second device. So the results may not be very accurate. Okay. So which is why to get a stable operating point, I've chosen a test bench this way. Uh, so here VDS1 and VDS2 can be independently set using this. Uh, so once you set a VG, uh, current, VGS1 and VGS2 are set. Then this circuit topology, uh, because you have RB1 and RB2 providing feedback between drain and source, uh, drain and gate, the drain to source voltages are also fixed. So VDS1 will simply be equal to VGS1 plus VB1 and VDS2 will be equal to VGS2 plus VB2. So I can independently set VB1 and VB2 uh, and, and vary VDS1 and VDS2. Okay. Now I al I've also added a capacitor CB here at the gate. So this is again to ensure that the second stage has to behave like a common gate amplifier. So at the frequencies of interest, this capacitor CB should look like a short circuit. Okay. And uh, so, so then I, I, what I have drawn here, what I have shown here, so what I have uh, shown here is the AC equivalent of the circuit. The capacitor will act like short circuits at the frequencies of interest. Now we have just RB1 and RB2. So we can actually derive the gain expression in terms of RB1 and RB2. I'm going to analyze it stage by stage. So the first stage is a common source configuration. We just derived it in the presence of RB. The gain can be approximated to minus GM R0 if your RB1 is much greater than R0. So that's the condition you have to satisfy. So RB1 has to be much greater than RO1. RO1 is the RO of the first device. So this is device 1 and device 2. And for the second stage gain, to find the second stage gain, it's not that uh, trivial so you can actually see that for the second stage so this is the gain of the first stage which is the common source so here we are at minus gm r naught times bi the second stage is a common gate configuration in the second stage your rb actually comes directly in parallel with the output resistance rb2 so since rb2 comes directly in parallel with the output resistance itself you should ensure your rb2 is much greater than r out Okay, where R out is, you know, uh, intrinsic gain times R O one. So intrinsic gain of the second device, which is A two, I'll call it A O two, which is G M two R O two times R O one, the first output resistance of the first device. Okay, now I've said that R O one can be in the order of few um, kilo ohms, tens of kilo ohms, and uh, A O two the gain, the intrinsic gain will be will be of the order of twenty or thirty. So you will have the R out for a cascode structure will be of the order of few hundreds of kilo ohms. Okay, so few hundreds of kilo ohms, and uh, so if I choose R B to be R B two to be in the order of hundred mega ohms, so then uh, they don't really R B two and R B one will not interfere with the simulation results at all. Okay, so using this test bench, you can actually measure, uh, do an AC analysis to get the uh, unloaded gain of a cascode amplifier. Okay, and again, I've already discussed how to choose the capacitor values CC and CB here. You should ensure that these capacitors act like short circuit. So what is short circuit? I mean, its, it's impedance will become perfectly zero only at infinite frequencies. Okay, so you have to ensure that. So for example, if you see here, RB2 and CB1 will form a low pass filter. Okay, so none of the signal output signal should couple to the gate. 
So to ensure that Rb2 and Cb will form a low pass filter and that pole will occur at 1 by 2 pi Rb2 Cb. And similarly, CC, the impedance seen here will actually be 1 by GM. You can work it out. The impedance seen 1 by GM1 to be precise. And the pole location, this input will form will be at GM, GM1 by 2 pi CC. So again, you should ensure both these poles occur much, much lower than the simulation frequencies of interest. Okay, at those frequencies, this pole should not even come into the picture. So that, so if, if that is ensured, then it will just reduce to an equivalent as shown here. Okay, and if you also choose RB1 and RB2 accordingly, then you will get the overall gain. You It will simply be equal to the cascode gain, which is in this case, it is minus GM1 RO1 into GM2 RO2. Approximately, this is the gain of a cascode amplifier. In a similar way, uh, we can also set up a test bench for measuring the output resistance. So again, to measure the output resistance, if you recall, you have to short circuit the input, which I've done here. And then uh, there are two ways of measuring the output resistance. One, you can apply an AC voltage source at the output. But there, you cannot directly apply an AC voltage source. You have to apply. You have to, you have to capacitively couple it. You should apply a capac uh, apply it through a capacitor. Okay. So we'll have to apply some voltage, say V test AC voltage, and then measure the current flowing through this and take the inverse of it. So if you directly measure the current, you will get the conductance seen at this point, at with respect to ground. Uh, if you inverse invert the current, you are going to get the impedance. Instead, a much simpler way is to actually directly apply. Uh, AC current source like this. So the DC value of this current source is 0 and the AC magnitude is chosen as 1, 1 ampere AC magnitude. So in that case the output voltage V0 Fs is simply going to be I no, I DC or sorry I, I AC times Z of S. So since I have chosen this to be a unit magnitude current source at all frequencies, the output voltage will directly give you the impedance. Okay, so you have to choose the DC current as zero. So you can directly apply your current source in parallel at the output and it won't disturb your DC operating point because your DC current source is zero and its impedance is also infinite, it's ideal current source. So it won't really interfere with your output resistance. But the values of RB1 and RB2 will interfere with our output resistance. So that's something we'll have to take care of here. Okay, so uh, I have drawn the AC equivalent circuit here. Those capacitors are short circuit at the frequencies of interest shown here. I have drawn the AC equivalent. The output resistance of a cascode configuration will be RO2, that's RO2 of this device, plus 1 plus GM2 RO2, 1 plus the intrinsic gain of the second device, times whatever you connect at the source of the second device. So if you see the impedance at the source, you are going to have at, at this point, at the source here, the impedance is going to be RO1 parallel RB. Okay, R RB1. So there is RB1 in parallel. So that's going to be RO1 parallel RB1. So this will be the effective impedance at C net R out. Now this whole thing will come in parallel with RB2. So that will be your actual output resistance. I've called I've called the R out dash as the output resistance which you will be measuring in the test bench. Okay, that will be R out in parallel with RB2. So there are two conditions you'll have to satisfy here. RB1 has to be much greater than RO1. So this has to be ensured. If you ensure that, then this result will simply reduce to the expression for the R out of a cascode configuration. Now this R out is going to come in parallel with RB2 because your RB2 is between drain of the second device to ground. Okay. So then you'll have to ensure RB2 to be much greater than R out. So I've said that we can choose it in the order of hundreds of mega ohms. And since the, for, for all the practical simulations that I had so far done, the value of the cascode output resistance is in the order of few hundreds of kilo ohms. Okay, so this will not interfere. RB will not interfere with your output resistance measurements. So the conditions you'll have to ensure is RB2 should be much greater than R out. So choosing it as 100 mega ohms works perfectly fine. For RB1, it has to be just greater than R01. That's it. You don't. It doesn't. Need, it doesn't have to be really that large. But uh, to ensure that you know there is no issues in the simulation, I generally choose both RB1 and RB2 to be of the order of 100 ohms, 100 mega ohms. Okay, so this way you will directly get 
uh, the output resistance of a cascode configuration by using a AC current source. So uh, that's it about the test bench to measure the parameters of a cascode configuration. The next lecture we will talk about cascode amplifiers in the presence of loads. We haven't really analyzed it with, with, with different kinds of loads how does the cascode amplifier behave.